Hi, this is Chris Davis, and this is a presentation for Education 6030, Theory and Practice of Online Education, and today's topic will be the history of distance education. Distance education has its roots in something called correspondence courses. Correspondence courses were the very first type of distance learning, and they were offered through the Postal Service. Colleges and universities would make these courses available to anyone who wanted to take them, and all of the coursework was done via the mail. So the instructor or the professor or whoever was offering the course would mail you the materials, such as the books and the worksheets and the homework assignments, things like that, and you would do the work on your own, <clears throat> and when you were finished, you would pack it back up in the mail and send it back to the university or to the professor or to the company. They would grade it, give it feedback, and mail it back to you along with your next set of work assignments. <clears throat> Obviously, this took quite a long time to finish because you had to wait for mail, and so the feedback wasn't instant, and there wasn't really a lot of face, well, there was no face to face interaction between the uh, student and the teacher. And you'll find that correspondence courses really existed, and in fact they still exist to some degree today, but they really started to go out in the early 1990s with the advent of uh, online education. <clears throat> Isaac Pittman, he's known as the father of distance learning, and the reason he's called the father of distance learning is because he, in 1840, began offering a correspondence course to teach people shorthand, and this was the very first ever correspondence course. Uh, he would mail you uh, some materials on how to learn shorthand and some instruction in a book or, or, in, or in an essay, and then would also mail you some, some things uh, such as a section of a book or something like that that he had written, and he would have you write it in shorthand and send it back to him, which he would then look at, grade, and send feedback to you, along with some more assignments that you could finish. The University of London, in 1858, allowed students to start taking course examinations without actually taking the class, and this really kind of paved the way for distance learning prep courses, um, and it actually still exists today in a form called CLEP. And in fact, at most colleges and universities, if you are proficient in a subject such as physics or math or chemistry or English, something like that, you can actually take what's called a CLEP exam. And the CLEP exam basically looks at the objectives of the course and all of the, all of the goals inside there and structures a test to see if you actually know the content. So if you pay the fee, take the CLEP test and pass it, you get college credit for that course as if you had taken it. And it is available again at most colleges and universities across the country and across the world. William Rainey Harper in 1880 developed the first college level correspondence courses at a place called Chautauqua College. And his courses he then later took with him to the University of Chicago in 1892 where he became president. Um, so now you had two major universities in, uh, in the United States which were offering uh, correspondence courses. And so more and more colleges as we get into the early 1900s, you'll see that more and more colleges across the United States stop, start offering correspondence courses because it's a very convenient way for them to bring more students in, especially colleges that service a very rural area. So by the early 1900s, there were hundreds of American colleges that offered correspondence courses, again, because it was a very convenient way to bring students into the classroom. Uh, they didn't have to be physically present, so you could be 50, 100 miles away from a college and be taking college courses through correspondence. So people that lived in remote areas or who were farmers or just could not get into class could take these correspondence courses, work at their own pace, and then just mail the materials back when they were finished and get their college credit. <clears throat> this is basically the same theory that's followed today. So you're probably wondering, what does ice cream have to do with uh, correspondence courses? Well, I'm sure probably all of you at one point have eaten Ben and Jerry's ice cream. And in 1977, Ben Cohen and Jerry Greenfield actually completed a correspondence course at Penn State on ice cream making. And for those of you that don't know, ice cream making is actually a major at Penn State. <clears throat> Penn State was actually 
started in Pennsylvania as an agricultural college. So you'll actually see a lot of majors at Penn State, like uh, there's, a, there's a major there in golf course management, there's a major in uh, agriculture, there's a bunch of agriculturally related majors there, and one of them happens to be ice cream making. And on May 5th, 1978, uh, Ben and Jerry opened their first store in Burlington, Vermont, based on the knowledge that they had picked up in this Penn State correspondence course, and the rest is really history. Uh, some other early forms of distance education. Uh, in the very early 1900s, uh, several colleges tried distance education through the radio. Unfortunately, it wasn't very successful, and none of them had, had uh, sustained long-lasting programs in, in distance education through the radio. Uh, they just couldn't find the audience for it. By the mid-1900s, five universities began using television in their teaching, and the University of Iowa was the, actually the very first to do this. So the use of television in distance education is actually quite common, and uh, by the 1950s there were 17 educational programs who were using television as part of their curriculum. And by 1961, there were 53 schools that were affiliated with what's called the National Education Television Network. And what the National Education Television Network did was establish a library of shared instructional films. So, for instance, if Robert Morris was a part of this, we would create instructional videos here that would become part of this lending library. And if another institution needed them, they could borrow those videos from us and we could borrow videos from them much the same way that our lending library works right now. So if you need a book or a magazine or something that we don't have here, you can get it from another university uh, through a lending library. And that's really how this worked at first. Now, of course, it was kind of slow because everything went through the mail or through courier because this was before streaming video and before the Internet. So, you know, we had to do everything through the mail and through courier. But it allowed us to start sharing materials more efficiently between colleges. And it also allowed students who were at one college to participate in courses from another college. Sunrise Semester was another example of television distance education. Uh, it was in, founded in 1957 by NYU, and they actually offered real college courses via television, live television. Uh, students could get NYU college credits by paying for the course and passing the exams. And it aired at 6 o'clock in the morning, and it actually lasted until 1982. And uh, what you found around 1982 is this is where this is kind of the advent of PBS, public broadcasting system. Uh, so PBS really started to take over a lot of the uh, educational television. So things like Mr. Rogers and Sesame Street and, you know, some of you might remember the electric company and things like that. And now there's some other educational television stations out there. There's one called PBS Sprouts. Uh, there's one called Noggin. Uh, those are both preschool oriented channels and you can really see the advent of this throughout uh, cable television as well. Look at all the stations out there that are educationally oriented like the Learning Channel, the History Channel, the Military Channel, the Home and Garden Channel. All of these types of TV channels, cable television channels, offer educationally related television. They're teaching you how to do something or showing you how to do something or giving you history of something or a background of something. So even today we still have a lot of television education. The flying classroom is something that's really neat. Uh, it was something that was done by Purdue University. Uh, through a corporate grant they actually flew an airplane over several of the central states in the US and transmitted educational programming uh, via radio. And this was done, of course, before the internet and satellite were readily available. In fact, the internet wasn't available at all. Satellite was available, but it was mainly restricted to government and corporate uses because it was so expensive. And these programs were targeted at elementary and middle school students and uh, were really offered, well, of course, they were offered on a free basis. All you had to do was tune in and learn. Uh, educational media, this is something that we still use today. Uh, schools start, started to begin offering instruction on audio tapes and later in the 1980s on CDs. So you could send away and they would send you back a cassette tape or a CD and you could listen to you know recorded instruction and recorded lectures. And soon after that, colleges began to offer um, instruction on VHS and DVD. And in fact, this still exists today. And in fact, some of you have probably seen on television a commercial for a place called the Video Professor 
where the guy's on television, he's offering you a free DVD to learn one of his products, I think is what he always says. And uh, it's, a, it's a DVD to teach you how to use the computer or, or to learn how to use Word or Excel or something like that. And if you like it, then his, you know, his goal is that he'll sell you more of these DVDs. But it's still a common, it's still a very common way of transmitting educational media to, or educational, uh, education in general, excuse me, to, to people is by using educational media. The Great Books Program, this is something that still exists today. It was started in 1946 by Mortimer Adler and Robert Hutchins. And basically what it was done, it was it used to introduce the classics, literature, literature classics, uh, through a four-year correspondence course to high school students, to those that were you know, wanting to attain a liberal arts education or who were trying to compete for seats in Ivy League schools or more prestigious colleges. Uh, they would start as freshmen, and they would, they would go and they would read books such as the Iliad, such as uh, Henry David Thoreau, Old Testament, New Testament, William Shakespeare, Dostoevsky, uh, so all of these classics, the classics of literature. <coughs> Excuse me. And what would happen is that through correspondence, through the mail, they would read a book and then the course would send them out things that they would have to write responses to parts of the books and they would mail that back. Well, it still exists today, but as you can imagine, it's not done through correspondence anymore. It's actually done online. And if you want more information about the Great Books Program, you can Google Great Books Program and it will take you out to their website. And in fact, I believe that I have the... Uh, the, the URL for great books in my references section at the end of this presentation. The teaching company was founded in 1990 uh, and it actually uses uh, educational media through correspondence. It was founded by a man named Thomas Rollins who is the chief counsel of the US Committee on Labor and Human Resources and it offers college courses via DVD and VHS. So you can watch on DVD or VHS a real college course and then participate through correspondence or through online uh, you know, with, uh, with, with the actual class and get real college credit. And it actually offers college credit in all subject areas. Um, so you're able to take a chemistry class or a physics class or an English class or a math class, whatever you need. And you can find more information, again, in the references section. I believe I do have the uh, URL in the back there for the teaching company. Uh, so early online education, it was began in the 1990s, right around the advent of the internet, and the two schools that really started online education, the first two schools to really have online programs, were Empire State University in New York and Thomas A. Edison University in New Jersey. And uh, after after the early 1990s, online education just began to explode. And if you think about today's online education, almost all colleges and universities offer online courses and that's true here at Robert Morris we offer a lot of online courses here in fact you're taking one of course some colleges even specialize in online courses and I'm sure you're gonna recognize some of these names University of Phoenix Walden University Kaplan University and Capella University University of Phoenix is probably the most well-known and in fact the University of Phoenix started almost exclusively as an online college and now they actually are branching out and have satellite campuses across the country and in fact in Monroeville uh, and, and for those of you that aren't in Pennsylvania um, Monroeville is a suburb of Pittsburgh but in Monroeville there is actually a satellite campus for University of Phoenix so you can go there and take a live instructor-led face-to-face University of Phoenix class and here are the references that I've that I used for this presentation. Um, if you have any questions about this presentation or you need some more information, uh, please just get in touch with me. And if not, I will see you next time.